Good morning, everybody. How was the weekend? Good? I got called into an MRI finally for my back, and um, they gave me, so like, I have back pain, both in the lumbar and the cervical, and so they have to give me a medicine that makes it so that I don't wiggle uh, during the MRI, because I always tell you things like, don't breathe, don't move, don't do all this kind of stuff. And, um, and that medicine has still got me feeling kind of dizzy, loopy, something like that. So we're going to do a lot of integrals today. I'm going to be very loopy, so it's going to be very fun. Don't drink and derive. Or something like that. All right. Uh, good heavens, is this where we left off? Oh, what an awful thing to leave off on. Let's, uh, let's watch a video instead. One that has to do with the Bios of our law and what it kind of is trying to do and what it means. So let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, where is it? It's right. No, no, no. Where is it? Right there. Electric current flowing through a long straight wire produces a magnetic field that circulates around the wire. But how does the strength of the field depend on the distance from the wire? If a tiny segment of electric current could exist, it would produce a magnetic field proportional to the inverse square of the distance. The direction of the field is related to the direction of the current by the right-hand rule, or the vector cross product. Yee. The field would be biggest when the current segment and distance vector are perpendicular. But electric currents can never exist in tiny segments. So any real magnetic field must be found by adding up or integrating the contributions due to each segment of a flowing current. The field, due to current flowing in a long straight wire, is always perpendicular to the wire, and decreases as the inverse first power of the distance from the wire. The net result is a field that goes in circles. The lines of force are circles concentric with the wire, and the field is the same all the way around each circle. So the integral we're about to do is going to give us this. So that's at least we know where we're going, right? The question is, how do we get there? And they, they were using slick computer, gra well, not slick, ancient computer graphics to pull off some, so what amounts to some very scary mathematics, right? We got we to gotta do this. We got to do this um, cross product inside of this integral, right? So that's what we're going to do now. Let's see if we can't survive it. Uh, what do I want to bring? Well, let's just start over here. We'll kind of back up just a little bit. So what we're going to do today, today our goal is to not point at the moth or whatever that is. We're going to... We're going to try to get all of the bad math done. OK? So you're going, to, you're going to learn how to employ this, but then more importantly, learn what the sort of punchline is so we can use the punchlines to figure out what's going to happen next. All right, so what does that look like? Bios of Arla. We have this little tiny piece of magnetic field we're looking for. And we've got to figure out what all of these parts and how they work. So I'm going to take a, a wire like that. I'm going to put it on an x and a y axis, so something like that, something like this. I'm going to pick just a, like an arbitrary piece of that wire over here, maybe. Like X and Y. 
and then I'm going to pick a point P up here on this Y axis where we are going to find the magnetic field. Now, that magnetic field, right, is going to be there not just because of the magnetic field coming from that section of the wire, but it's going to be coming from all the other sections of the wire, right? And we're going we're gonna to teach the integral how to add up all along this wire so that we can add up all of these vectors and find the magnetic field at that point. And then by extension, the magnetic field everywhere around the wire. Okay, so to do that, I'm going to fall back on kind of what I already know how to do, which is I can draw R vectors, right? So this is my little DS. It's going to be like a DX section of the wire. I'm going to draw a vector an R vector that starts on the thing causing magnetic field and ends at the point where I'm trying to find the magnetic field. That um, vector is going to make an angle with respect to this wire. So what's the angle if like we're directly like on the perpendicular bisector? What's, what's R's angle going to be? Yeah, it's going to be 90 degrees, right, if we're, if we're like right here. Angle would be 90. For over here, it's going to be bigger than 90. For over here, and if we were to send this out infinitely far, spoiler alert, that's what we're going to do later, then the angle would become zero, right? OK. So <clears throat> let's see. We've got that. We've got that. Uh, if I call this distance over here, if I call that x, I'm going to have to put a negative sign on it. Why negative? What side of zero am I on? We're on the left hand side, aren't we? Negative side? All right. So I think I've got kind of all the language I've got going here. My, my current is flowing this way, so technically my DS is also pointed that way because the DS follows the same direction as the current. And away we go. I'm going to try and start setting up this, this integral. Um, uh, let's, should we tackle the R hats and the R's and all that stuff first? Let's do that. So we can do this either way. We can do like R vector divided by R cubed. That's probably my preferred way. We got to figure out what R hat is, right? But if we know what R vector is, R vector is going to be... Well, in the language I've got here, I'm going to call this distance right here A. I could call it Y, but I don't really want to attach it to a coordinate system. I'm just going to leave that as a distance A. All right. So if that's the case, my R vector is what? It goes plus X I hat plus A J hat, doesn't it? goes over positive x and up a. So what's its magnitude going to be? It's going to be that. And then I can find my r hat vector by taking my r vector and dividing by its magnitude. So that's going to be plus x i plus a j all over the square root of x squared plus a squared. Something like that. Okay, so I, I can find my R hat that way and plug it in, or I could just make that R vector. That's what I should have done in the first place. Um, but I but there but there's another another way to go about this, which does involve the right hand rule. You're like Mr. Bela, it's, it's bad enough already that I've got to put that in an integral. Why are we going to involve a right hand rule? Well, it does, right hand rules do let us sort of write these cross products as not cross products anymore. What's uh, one way to write a cross product if, if we don't want to have a cross product anymore? This can be written as, or at least its magnitude can be written as vector A times vector b 
like magnitude vector A, magnitude vector B times the sine or cosine? Sine of the angle between them. So let's see if there's uh, a way out of this sort of R vector hell we've got going on over here. Maybe through a right hand rule that can simplify what's going on. So uh, ds and r hat. What direction is ds pointed? It's to the right, isn't it, along the x-axis? r is pointed up not at quite 90 degrees, but it is pointed up along the y-axis a little bit, right? So if I apply a right hand rule to this and I say, OK, I'm going to I go handshake in the direction of my first thing, which is ds, and then I kind of bring my fingers up in the direction of r, my thumb ends up pointing which way? Out of the screen. ds and r are both living in the xy plane. So that means that whatever I get, I'm going to get something perpendicular to the xy plane, which will be in the z direction. The only question is, is it into or out? And in the case of the right hand rule here, this is going to be pointed out. So this is my magnitude, and it's going to be pointed out of the page by the right hand rule. So what I've done there is I managed to kind of get rid of a cross, I've done a cross product, I've got the magnitude of the cross product, and I got the direction from the right hand rule. DS and DX all point in the same direction as current, which is flowing to the right. The position negative X is because I'm on the left hand side. And the like yeah. If they don't, then we're in real trouble. Okay. So what does that mean about rewriting this 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 whole thing up here? Okay. Well, it's mu naught i over 4 pi. And now I can just write ds, whatever that is. We'll get to that in a second. What's the magnitude of r hat? It's a unit vector. What, what do all unit vectors magnitudes, what are they? Just one. And then I have a sine theta. And then I put that over r squared. All right. We're getting there a little bit. Getting there a little bit. I'm going to massage this um, slightly just to kind of get everything speaking the same language. For, OK. The mu naught i over 4 pi, what is that? Is that going to have anything, is anything going on with that during our integral? That's eventually going to happen. Nothing. Those are all constants, right? They are what they are. ds. I'm just going to replace with dx. That's a symbol swap. There's no physics going on there. And then I've got a sine theta, and I have an r squared. Nothing changed there. Again, just kind of cleaning up just a little bit. OK. To be able to integrate this, <laughs> I need r x and theta to all be talking to each other. Question. No. I did. I was saying that I could do that over here, right? Uh, let's use a different color for that. So this right here. This cross product is put right down here and became this, right? And then I resubstituted it back into this. This r squared stayed the same no matter what. Okay. What, I, what I said over here is that I could have done something like this, and then I would have ended up with this mess. And I really don't want to put that mess into here. That's what I'm trying to avoid. So I decided, you know what, let's, let's go a different path. Use our right hand rule and all that kind of stuff. So, but good job trying to catch me out because that's the kind of mistake that I would make. But no, I'm pretty confident that we're here. We're in a, we're in a good spot with this one right here. Now, R, X, and theta. Oh my God. How are these things related to each other? Triangles. <sighs> yeah, triangles. 
It's different ways you can take triangles, isn't there? The triangle we have, we have an R, we have a theta, we have an A, and we have like a, 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 like a negative X sitting over here, right? Okay, so again, I'm I think I'm trying to avoid this. All these Cartesian things. Why am I trying to avoid Cartesian things? I know that the answer, based on the video, I know that the answer has to come out as circles, doesn't it? I want to kind of stay in a language. Cartesian isn't really the native language of circles. So, I'm tempted to kind of turn this into angular things, and that worries me a little bit because, well, you'll see. It, this is going to get better before, this is going to get worse before it gets better, but it is going to get better. The sine of theta from this triangle would be A over R, wouldn't it? Yeah. And so that means that R is going to be A over sine theta, what's a way, another way to write 1 over sine theta? Cosecant. Co and Mr. Bailey, I haven't thought about a cosecant in forever. It's okay, neither have I. All right, and then tangent of theta is going to be y over that. And then if I solve that, I get the cotangent. Is that what 1 over tangent is, the cotangent? And you're like, Mr. Bale, cosecants and cotangents, this is getting worse. But what I, I'm going to take advantage of something that happens in an integral. Namely, we need, a, we need a dx out of this, right? So when we do a dx of this function, then what is the what is the d what is the derivative of the negative cotangent of theta? Cotangent. Cotangent. Not according to my notes. It's the cosecant squared. This would become a cosecant squared of theta d theta. And why is that helpful? Well, watch what happens. We are going to take this R right here. Did that just go away? Mm. Why does it do this? It worked all for 4A and then decided to go away. I have not chased it down to whether it's my iPad or my computer. It looks like my iPad this time. The Wi-Fi dropped. That's why it did it. And we're back, maybe? All right, let me know if it goes away. We're going to take this dx, and we're going to stick it right in there. 
we're going to take this R and we're going to stick it right in there. That, that's the path that we're going to take through this and see where it gets us. Constants are along for the right. dx is a cosecant squared theta d theta. And then there's a sine theta floating around in here. And then my r is squared, so it's a squared cosecant squared theta. It looks bad, but what's going to happen? A lot of stuff is going to cancel here, right? This cosecant squared, one of these a's. So what are we left with? We're left with a db that's equal to mu naught i over 4 pi a, it's a constant, times sine theta d theta. All right. With that, Let me add one. No. Copy and paste. You can do it. I got the A. I moved it in. I moved it in with the rest of the constants. Because it is because it is constant. With that, I can now integrate both sides. So what's the integral of adding up all the little tiny magnetic field contributions going to be? It's going to be the entire magnetic field. The mu naught i 4 pi a integral of sine theta d theta looks a whole lot easier than what I had to deal with right here, wasn't it? all that cross product and all that stuff that was in it, okay? So now the question is, what are the limits, right, that we, we go between? And the answer is, well, that depends on how long, the, um, how long the wire is, right? So we'll just leave it generic. We're, we're integrating between these, these angles. Got an angle, whoops. We've got an angle right here and like I can start at this end, whatever that angle is, and then the angle changes as I go, but it's going to start from some small angle over here and end at some big angle over here. And uh, I know the integral of sine theta. Cosine theta? Negative cosine theta? Negative cosine theta. I, know I could never ever remember what was negative and what was positive. A, uh, and then this will be negative cosine theta evaluated from theta 1 to theta 2. And so we end up basically flipping the order or pi A cosine theta 1 minus cosine theta 2. So there it is. What the heck is that thing in the box? That is the magnetic field magnitude around a wire segment, like just a, a certain length of wire in a magnetic field. You might be like, well, Mr. Balo, the length's not in here. You're right, it's not in there quite yet. This length is being more determined by some angles, right, that are being made with respect to this thing. But let's push it to its absolute extreme, which is the extreme that we need to be because again we usually don't have like segments of wire sitting out in space we're going to have an, like an infinitely long wire that's producing these things so what would the angles turn into if it were an infinitely long wire so for the infinite wire theta 1 would be 0 theta 2 would be what no 180 okay and so what's the cosine of 0 1 and then what's the cosine of 180 negative. negative 1 so that is a 1 minus a minus 1 which is a 2 so it's going to be mu naught i over 2 pi a this is the field for an infinitely long 
wire. But there is something missing. What's missing? Yeah, direction's missing, isn't it? Okay. It's a, the magnetic field's a vector thing, isn't it? We have the magnitude of this field. Let's just let's just say so. Let's let's just dive in a little bit with this magnet. And and by the way, the miracle is is that it came out that simple after all of the. How many of you were confused here? I mean, I was, and I looked at it all this morning. Okay, this is just like what? Why? How would the? Huh? Why would anybody do it this way? That's the wrong question. It's like, who's the genius that figured it out this way? <laughs> right? Okay. Now, the amazing part, okay, is that all of that formulaic um, formalism for defining what a piece of the magnetic field might be and then getting it to all add up correctly and all comes out to something that is so simple at the end, right? So, Mu naughts floating around in there, it's good. We needed that constant because we are talking about magnetic fields. The magnetic field strength, does it depend on the current in the wire? Yeah, the more current you have, the stronger the field is. Um, two pi's along for the ride, and then this A that I've given you, I write A, your book probably writes R. The same, what is that A? It's the distance away, so if you've got a straight wire like this, okay, and I want to find the magnetic field at this point, this distance away from this wire, that would be A, right? It's the straight line distance away from that wire. Okay, so now we have the magnitude anywhere in space around this wire, and we know from the video that that field was symmetric. It was, it was circles that go around the wire. So now we have to deal with direction. And this is where we are going to have a different right hand rule. So what right hand rule have we had so far? The handshake, right? The handshake was used to find the force acting on a wire or a charge in a magnetic field. The handshake I'm about to teach you now is for finding magnetic field direction from a current carrying wire. There won't be any, there's no force in this one, right? It's just magnetic field from a wire. I call this the hitchhiker rule. Everybody get your hitchhikers out. Don't go hitchhiking, okay? It's dangerous. But like, let's get those big thumbs up going. I'm doing a genetics experiment here because there's really two kinds of thumbs in the world. Apple, let's see your thumb there for a second. Yeah, hold your thumb up. Up high so everybody can see it. Sort of side view here, okay? Do you see, do you see apples and my thumbs basically kind of point straight up? Does anybody have one where it really dips over backwards? Yeah, you do? Hold yours up, nice and high. Do you see the angle that his thumb makes? Okay. This is great. This is Matthew's thumb. This is perfect. This is called Hitchhiker's Thumb right here. Okay? I believe, I could get this wrong. Thank you very much. I believe that is the dominant genetic trait. And that straight thumbs are the recessive trait. Okay? So there you go. There's your biology teaching for the day. Okay? I might have it backwards as to which one's dominant and recessive. The point is, okay, that if both of your parents had that trait, then you get one of them, or whatever the beans and some monk in a field, and that biology, okay? So, hitchhiker, okay? You're going to take your hand and put it in the hitchhiker form. Your thumb is gonna go in the direction of the current. So if this pipe represents my wire and I've got current, say, flowing down this wire, okay? Your fingers will wrap around the wire in the direction of the magnetic field. So if you want to, you can like grab your pencil, right? Put your pencil in the direction of the, of the current and then like direct your thumb along the, your pencil. Your finger will wrap around in the direction of the magnetic field as it goes around the wire. 
Where is it strongest? Close to the wire, where A is small, right? If A is small, this becomes a big thing, right? The further away we get, the weaker it gets. But the directions will be indicated by the directions that our fingers wrap around the wire. So, for example, if we have a wire that has current flowing to the right, you can take your pencil or whatever, right? Which way are you going to put your thumb? To the right. Your fingers wrapping around your pencil or whatever you want to do, right? Which way are your fingers pointed above the wire? Out of the page. And which way are they pointed as you go around? Into the page. So we would draw that as out on top and into on the bottom. If we were to rotate this and say that our current was flowing into the screen, current's flowing into the screen, which way do we put our thumb? Into the screen, which way are our fingers wrapping around? Clockwise around the wire, so our magnetic fields would be doing this. Something like that. So we're back to having to draw in three dimensions on two-dimensional surfaces, right? So. so again, the two boxes on this screen are kind of nice. For a straight line wire segment of any length, as long as you can find the angles that subtend that length, you're golden. There is the magnetic field for an infinitely long straight wire. And then what we're going to spend the rest of the day is developing things for like rings and circles and stuff like that uh, based off of this so that we don't have to go back and reinvent this wheel. Okay. Let's watch the videos. The videos. I wonder if is it this that's killing it? I doubt it. We'll use this vertical copper wire to demonstrate the right-hand rule of magnetic field production. A small compass near the wire reacts when a current runs upward in the wire. As the compass is moved in a circle around the wire, the needle shows the magnetic field is tangential to the circle at all places and points in the direction the fingers of a right hand would curl if the thumb were pointing in the direction of the current through the wire. Reversing the direction of the current leaves the shape of the pattern unchanged, but the field lines now point in the opposite direction. As predicted by the right hand rule. So circulation of magnetic field around a current carrying wire. Tomorrow in lab, you're going to be doing that. We're going to give you some wires. We're going to give you some magnets. We're going to give you some compasses, a lot of compasses, <laughs> and some magnetic field probes. And you are going to draw pictures of what these magnetic fields look like um, based on the situations that we give you. Tomorrow's lab is not terribly mathematical. It's, it's very conceptual. All right, uh, but you don't have to bring any different colored pencils this time. You can if you want. OK, so three points, A, B, and C. We've got two current carrying wires, as indicated. And we are going to find the magnetic field at all three of these points. We know the magnetic field for a wire. U naught I over 2 pi A, where A is the distance from the current uh, to the point where we're looking for it. So we, so we know this is our operative equation. We know that the direction can be given by the right-hand rule. And we know that it's a field. 
and fields are vector quantities. And so if we have more than one thing making a field, we can break this down vector by vector and add vectors together. In other words, we can find the field from the top 10 amp wire, find the field from the 20 amp bottom wire, and at all of those points, add together those vector fields to get the total field. This is not something new. We've done stuff like this before. We did it with electric field. We did it with electric potential, where you calculate the potential of, at one point, and then different point, and compare them. We're doing the same thing. What's new is that we're going to use our newfound knowledge of the magnitude of a magnetic field to help us find these things. So um, we got we to gotta break this up in such a way that like, we can keep track of what's going on here. So I think I'm going to do, I'll do A, point A in red. Okay. So I know it's a little bit small from what you're saying, but all of those measurements there are 10 centimeters away from each other. I know the current um, in the top wire is 10 amps, and the current in the bottom wire is 20 amps, and they are going in opposite directions. So to find the total magnetic field at point A, magnitude and direction, I, I need to find, why did I put a plus? I need to find the magnetic field from the 10 amp wire at point A and add it to the magnetic field of the 20 amp wire at point A. Which means I have to find those two things. I've got to find out what B10 is and I have to find out what B20 is. Well, I know like magnitude wise, going to be mu naught i over 2 pi a, this is i10. The other one's going to be mu naught i20 over 2 pi a. We'll get to those a's in a second because they could be different. But what are we going to do about directions? What do we get out to find the directions of a magnetic field around a current carrying wire? You gotta do the hitchhike, you gotta hitchhike for ideas, <laughs> right? <laughs> Your brain is broken down on the side of the road. You need to be picked up, <laughs> right? Hitchhike, okay? All right, so for the 10 amp wire, we're only looking at point A right now. So my thumb is pointed to the right. My fingers are wrapping around such that they come out of the screen at point A. Everybody, if you, if you can't see it, get your right hand out and be doing it, right? Here's the wire. So you can take your pencil, you put your thumb to the right, and your fingers wrap around the pencil. And so above the pencil, they're pointing out at you. And at the bottom of the pencil, they're curling away from you. So point A up there from the 10 amp wire, which way is my magnetic field going to be pointing? out of the page, right? So we could say positive k hat. All right, what about the 20 amp wire? So I have my wire. I have my 20 amps pointing to the left. So I put my thumb along the, the left hand direction and my fingers are pointed which way? At point A, above this 20 amp wire pointed into the page, isn't it? So that would be a minus k hat. All right, so on my left, mu naught i10 k hat all over 2 pi. And what do I put in for the distance from the 10 amp wire? For the 10 amp wire? Oh, sorry. <laughs> 10 centimeters or 0 0.10 meters. Remember, put it, do it in meters. And then for the 20, now Nico, you can go. Okay, we're going to put in 0.3 meters, 30 centimeters away, because the total distance, right, from this wire is 10, 20, 30 centimeters away. All right. 
And then I would throw in the numbers. I probably should have said this was 10 amps. And then I could put in here that this was 20 amps. Notice I'm not going to put in negative 20. Why am I not going to put in negative 20? I've already made sure to figure out the directions based on my right hand rule. Okay. Yes, because mu naught is in standard units. Pi has no units. That's that's fancy. Yeah. Amps, right, is is a standard unit. You'd have to put it in centi amps or something like that. Some weird yeah. Let's no, convert everything into standard units. It's safer. Um, and then, so one of these is going to be positive, one of them is going to be negative, right, in terms of their numbers. I didn't get the intermediate numbers. All I got was what this was. It was 6.7 times 10 to the minus 6 Teslas. Um, and it was a positive number, which meant that it was pointing out of the page. Let's see if that makes sense. Pointing out of the page. Um, why would the 10 amp wires pointing out of the page win over the 20 amp wires pointing into the page? It's closer. Less current, like three times less current, but it is three times closer, right? So expect it to win. Okay, uh, what about point B? What's our approach? Same exact approach, right? The magnetic field at point B is going to be the sum of the two magnetic field from the wires. I'll just do magnitude here, mu naught. I 10 over 2 pi. How far away is the um, 10 amp wire from point B? 0.1 meters. And what's the direction for the 10 amp wire at point B? It's into the page. Thumb is to the right. Fingers wrap all the way around and down. And when I come down, they're pointing into the page, so call that a negative k hat. B20 mu naught times uh, 20 all over 2 pi. All right, and for the 20 amp wire, how far away is it? 0. 0.1. And we already determined that when we did a right hand rule above the wire, it still pointed into the page. So negative k. So in effect, what are we going to do with these two numbers? Just add them together and put a negative k on it, which I did. And I got negative 6.0 times 10 to the minus 5 k hat Teslas. Like that. All right, and then point C. What's different about point C here? Yeah, we got mu naught. It's still going to be 10 amps, 2 pi. But what's the diff distance now from the 10 amp wire? This one's at 30. B20 is going to be mu naught times 20 all over 2 pi times 0.1. But let's see, uh, at point C, the 10 amp wire field points which way, in or out? Yeah, the 10 amp wire, thumb, thumb points to the right, fingers wrapping around, it's going into. So this will be the negative k hat. Uh, for the 20 amp wire, now we're at point C. Our fingers go on top of the 20 amp, it goes into, but as they wrap around and come back around the bottom of the 20 amp wire, it points out, doesn't it? And it should come as very little surprise that that one wins because it's got a bigger current and it's closer. Yeah, go ahead. When do we get to the point where we know that they're on top of the bottom of the current, the wire? 
because of which point we're trying to look at. This point is below this wire, right? So if we're going to if we're going to find the magnetic field of this wire at that point, our fingers are below the wire now, right? I, I wrap my hands around and they're and they're coming out. My fingertips are pointed straight at my face when I do that, right? If I was trying to do it at point B, then my fingers are going into right there. Excellent questions. Okay, so overall approach with multiple wires is to find the magnetic fields from each individual wire and then, in quotes, add them together, minding their directions. Where are you going to get the directions from? Right hand rules. Yeah. Uh, 4 pi times 10 to the 7 in SI units. 7, right? Is negative 7? Negative 7. Okay. Now we need to do this. Okay. I you know it feels like we're moving fast, but that's okay. We want to get as far away from the Biot-Savart law as we can. <laughs> it's as fast as we can. Okay. So I've got this loop of wire. I want to find the magnetic field, just like we did with electric field, like on the axis, right? Uh, we've got like an axis that goes through the center. I just want to find the magnetic field anywhere on the axis of this loop. And now I've got to draw loops. OK, let's see. Can I get this thing to behave? Nah, not really. Free-handed instead. Dangerous, I know, but there we go. A little bit better. So here's an axis. Oh, that made it look like a disc, but it's not. It's just a wire. I'm going to call the radius big R because I want to distinguish that distance from the r vector that I'm going to have to use to figure this out. Um, because unfortunately, I can't use the equation for a straight wire for this one. So I do have to go to B o, back to BO sub r. That's what I have to do for this one. Shoot, I thought I was safe. OK, well, let's find it for that point right there. We'll call the distance x right there. Uh, my individual little piece of my loop is going to be right there. So my r vector is going to be sitting right there. OK. So v o sub r i over 4 pi ds crossed into r hat over r squared. Got to figure out all of these pieces. So um, mu naught i over 4 pi, that's a, that goes along for the ride. I kind of have r vector here already, but is there a way for me to pull a trick like I did last time and use a right hand rule to avoid having to do that cross product? So let's see. DS. DS has to follow the current or the, the loop, the, the physical shape of my wire. And so DS is kind of going along this wire, right, as current flows around it. It follows the loop of the wire. My R vector and DS. What angle exists between them always, no matter where I am on this circle? It's 90 degrees. So, so if I like, kind of look at it this way, ds always points along, like tangent to, if you will, along this wire, right? But my radial vector is like pointing kind of like this towards the center of the loop. And so kind of no matter where I look at this or how I look at this, 
the angle between this radius vector and the circle itself is always 90 degrees. So it's 90 degrees there, it's 90 degrees there, it's 90 degrees if it were pointed straight down. The angle between these two things is always 90 degrees. That's really nice because that lets me write my ds cross r hat as ds times 1 times the sine of the angle between them. Yeah, that, that's, that's like the magnitude of the, of the cross product, OK? Um, we're going to get the magnitude of this, and then we're going to deal with what the direction it points is in a second. All right. So uh, what does that let us write down now? Um, we can rewrite this thing. u naught i over 4 pi times ds sine theta all over r squared. And I'll go ahead and write the r vector as x squared plus big R squared. So we better come in here, clean that up. This is just going to be x squared plus R squared. So I just substituted in things as I knew them. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, this is even better, because it's sine of 90 degrees, isn't it? I, I, just end, I just finished arguing that so that I could then not have to include a trig function. Oh. Doesn't it feel so much better when no trig functions are involved? It's just so much, it's just so much better. OK. Um, all right. Can we do some physics-y stuff to make this even simpler on ourselves? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're not, we're not, we haven't done an integral yet. Right? We're, we're getting there. We're going we're gonna to have to integrate in a second. Um, but if I can avoid having to do an integral altogether, I'd, be, I'd like that. If I, could have, if I could get rid of a component, what direction would you guess, just based on prior experience in this class, what direction do you think the magnetic field points along the axis of that ring? In other words, at that point P, are, woo, don't do that. Are there Y components and X components of this magnetic field? Are the Y components going to cancel? We're going at, at just the top segment, right? If we're just here at this top segment of the loop and that's all we're looking at, right? Then yeah, there'll be X and Y components, right? But we're going to go all the way around, aren't we? As we go all the way around, what happens when we're on the bottom segment? We're going to have X still pointing to the right, but the Y component will be pointing up instead of down. And if we're on the two sides, left and right, so what are all those Y components going to do? They're going to cancel, right? So in a sense, dBY goes to zero due to symmetry. Okay? So that means that our magnetic field, when we're all done with it, is going to only have an X component. And so that means we need to rip off the X component of this thing right here, while simultaneously kind of dealing with DS. Um, okay, well, what does that look like? If DB is broken up into its component parts, one way to write that would be dBx cosine theta i hat plus dBy sine theta j hat. 
This is identical to if I have like my r vector here. It's like an alternate way to write the r vector. We almost always do like an x and a y and get it into like Cartesian. And you can see here, we're mixing Cartesian and angles. So we've got to fix that in a second. But I could write this r vector as its x component cosine theta plus y component sine theta and still get the, the same vector back out again. So that, that's kind of what's happening there. And then we ignore this one because we know it's going to go to 0 due to symmetry. So that means my dbx is going to be that. And away I go. I think now I can write all of this out. Is that true? Yes. My bx is going to be an integral mu naught i over 4 pi ds cosine theta all over x squared plus r squared. Um, that, it just looks like bad news, doesn't it? This is like cruel and unusual punishment for a Monday, isn't it? Let's strike that. This is cruel and unusual punishment for any day of the week. What, what comes out of this integral? What's constant? Everything but ds? Well, ds is the thing that we are integrating around on, so it can't come, it better not come out of the integral, otherwise we're in trouble. But the mu naught doesn't change, the current doesn't change, the 4 pi doesn't change. Does the x squared plus r squared change? No matter where we are on that circle, is the magnitude of x squared plus r squared changing? No. Is cosine of theta changing? No. I, we're just left with this. This happened to us back when we were doing electric fields. We were finding the electric field of a ring of charge, and we set up this big, huge thing, and it ended up like all of it just came out. <laughs> and then we just asked, oh, OK, well, what happens if you run, bunch up, you know, chop the ring up into little tiny charges and then add all those charges up? You just get Q, right? And we didn't actually have to do an integral. Well, here we are again, not having to do an integral. We had to do a bunch of setup, but we avoided the integral in the end. Um, and what, so what is the integral of ds if we go all the way around the ring? Remembering that s is a segment of the linear length of this thing. What's, what's the length of a circle? 2 pi r. So the circumference of the circle. That, that's what that integral says. It says give me the length of your loop. Can be mu naught i over 4 pi cosine theta along for the ride for the x component r squared times 2 pi r. All right, we still have angles mixed with Cartesian coordinates and pandemonium ensues because we really don't want that. So, what we're going to do is we're going to fix it. Cosine of theta by definition is the, um, the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. Adjacent side is big R. Hypotenuse is x squared plus r squared to the 1 half. And so now I can substitute that into this equation, to this equation. Substitute this into right there to get me the final answer. Magnetic field of a loop on its axis is mu naught i r squared all over, where did I end up with an r squared? I had a 2 pi r. 
I have a 2 pi big R, there it is, all over 2 x squared plus R squared to the 3 halves. So we just found every loop. We will have a loop radius of capital R, and then we will have a distance x that we are along its axis. But we now found the, magne the magnetic field anywhere along the axial direction of this loop. Okay? And if I go really, really far away, my x becomes really, really big, what happens to this magnetic field? Zero. Goes to zero, which you expect it to do, right? Get infinitely far away, we shouldn't see magnetic field anymore. More interesting question might be, what happens when we get right to the center? What's the value of x? What distance along the x-axis are we when we're right at the center? Zero. zero, OK? So if x equals zero at the center of the loop, then the magnetic field of a loop at its center is what? Mu naught i r squared all over 2 times r cubed. Did I do that right? It's r to the 3 halves of an r squared. Yeah, I did. So magnetic field of a loop at its center is going to be mu naught i over 2 r. What does that mean? This loop, if I have current flowing in it at the very center, will not have a zero magnetic field. It will have a non-zero magnetic field, mu naught over 2 r, where r is the radi big R is the radius of this loop. What direction does it point? Well, guess what you get to do now? Another right-hand rule. So we could, let's say, that the, um, let's say that the current is flowing around, what would this be for you, clockwise? OK. So at the top, we would point our thumbs along the top of the clockwise direction. What direction are my fingers wrapping around? In. And then I come over here, and they're pointed down. My fingers are still in. At the bottom, my fingers are still in. No matter where I am, Anywhere on this loop, my fingers are pointing in, right? Well, let me show you the corollary to the hitchhiker rule. We used our thumb as the direction of the current for straight line wires. If you reverse it and you use your fingers, your curled fingers, as the direction of current in a loop, your thumb will point in the direction at the center of the loop. It's OK, Bo. You'll be, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. There's too many right-hand rules now, right? Oh, there's more coming. OK? So how do we keep track of our right-hand rules? <laughs> this is why I developed this screen. <laughs> OK? <laughs> this is how I have always kept the right-hand rules straight in my head. I, if it works for you, great. If not, come up with some different system. Okay? Again, there are two broad categories of right-handed rules that we employ in physics. And I like to refer to them as the handshake versus the hitchhiker, right? Your hands in just like a different starting shape with those two. As far as handshakes are concerned, what are we finding? What's involved? Force, right? So force on a charge, force on a wire. You're given the force and you want to find the magnetic field. Force is involved somehow. You are going to be doing a handshake version, right? Whether that's the fingers pointed like this, or you start with the handshake, whatever version of that you want to do. That is a fundamentally different way of holding your hand at the start versus finding anything having to do with magnetic field. With magnetic field and currents, you're not looking for force now. You're just trying to find the magnetic field of a wire. That's hitchhiker. Okay. With 
two subvariants, which end up being the same thing. Okay? If your wire is straight, then your thumb is the current. Straight wire, straight thumb, your fingers curl around in the direction of the magnetic field. But if your wire is a loop, then your fingers must loop. Your thumb cannot loop. Your fingers curl around in the direction of the current. And what does your thumb tell you? The direction of the field at the center. It'll just be a single direction through the center. Now, of course, this loops field at the center is going one way, but it does form closed circles, right? We can go around this thing and find what those closed circles are. It's just they all add together at the center to always push in one way. Loops make magnetic fields that look like bar magnets, whereas straight wires just make circular fields. How you doing? Better or worse than electric fields? Worse. worse. Why is it worse? There was really bad math that you still don't understand, but that's okay. I told you at the very beginning, what should you be concentrating on? The punch lines, the things in the boxes. Understand those. Not know where they came from necessarily, but how to use them, right? You you want you want these you want these punch lines, okay? So you don't like I'm never going to ask you to do Biosavar on an exam. We're going to do we're going to get Biosavar out of our system so that we can apply it, right? But now you also are struggling with right hand rules, when to apply them, which ones to use at which time, and yes. There will be problems where you have to do both kinds multiple times in the same problem. So you need practice with applying which right hand rule for which situation, all that sort of stuff. And you, you got, you've got, you've got to practice that. Okay. Speaking of practice, let's do some practice.